thing that we hadn't talked about is what does that mean in the United States? In the United States, the jury makes the factual decision. And so what you see here on the screen is, in fact, the model jury instruction that are given in most 90% of patent cases. And the judge, having made the Markman decision, you need to realize that the Markman decision is, in fact, the first jury instruction that the court is developing. And here it is. This is what the court tells a jury in the U.S. case. I will now explain to you the meaning of the some, word, some of the words of the claims in this case. In doing so, I will explain some of the requirements of the claim. As I have previously instructed you, you must accept my definition of these words in the claim as correct. And then the court notes that that construction will be used in terms of infringement and or validity. So if you were wondering how in the U.S. system with the jury, the decisions made is the judge makes the construction, most typically at the Markman hearing, and that construction is the jury instruction that the jury is told about. Now, the Markman hearing, we know some history that it came about saying that the claim construction is a legal issue, but what people did not realize, and what always goes when you're trying to evaluate the system, is that Markman gave no guidance as to when the court should make the interpretation. So in this study from 2008, covering 2004 to 6, you see that some courts would have the Markman hearing, roughly 79%. Interestingly, more experienced judges were more likely to have a Markman hearing than less experienced judges. Some of them decided to do it in the context of summary judgment. There are many judges in the United States that actually do prefer to do claim construction in terms of summary judgment. The reason they want to do that is twofold. One, they only want to decide terms that matter. And if you do claim construction in the context of summary judgment, those are terms that the parties are actually fighting about. The problem with that is that it also potentially can lead you into legal error. In the United States, it's legal error to view or analyze the accused product or the original product in interpreting the claim. Uh, interestingly enough, what resulted after this is what they call the local patent rules. And so 24 courts in the United States have developed local patent rules, and many individual judges in the United States in districts that don't have local patent rules have adopted some form of local patent rules in their claim construction. And this is the heart of the U.S. claim construction process. So let's take a step here, because there's not an issue of just interpreting the claim. It's what claims do you interpret? Everywhere, whether it's the United States Federal Court of Appeals, the District Court, the courts here in Taiwan, courts have very busy dockets, and they only want to decide things that matter. And what the U.S. process is designed to do is focus the court's attention on claim construction issues that make a difference in the case. So in the local patent rules here, you have the typical events in the local patent rules. And I want to point out two things. One, procedure rules don't automatically result in a good result or automatically result in a bad result. The, in the United States, we've heard repeatedly about the Eastern District of Texas being viewed as the most patent friendly. Well, I reside in Palo Alto, California, in the Northern District of California, which is viewed as the most defendant-friendly jurisdiction in the United States, the most likely to grant summary judgment, the most likely to invalidate patents. The Northern District of California and the Eastern District of Texas have the identical local rules. In fact, the Eastern District of Texas local patent rules are based on the Northern District of California rules. Uh, the, Northern District rules were made by Judge White, who's a judge that sits in San Jose, California, and he worked with the local attorneys to come up with these rules. Judge Ward, who was at the time the judge in the Eastern District of Texas, came and said, we want to use your rules in our court. So whether you have these rules, it does not mean that you can use pro-patent or pro-defendant. But let's go over the key events. Early in the case, the local rules require infringement contentions. And what do the infringement contentions provide the parties? One, the identification of which claims will be at issue at the case from the beginning. Second, the identification of the accused products. 
including a claim chart explaining how each element of the asserted claims is found in the accused product. After the infringement contentions, the defendants have to provide the invalidity contentions, which identifies all the prior art that they're going to rely on at trial to try to invalidate the patent, and you have to explain whether or not this is anticipatory art or obviousness art, and you have to then explain why there's a combination, and you have to provide a claim chart that shows where each element of the claim is found in the prior art. Only when both the patent holder and the defendant have that information does the claim construction process in the United States begin. The next step is the identification of claim terms. In the United States, most district courts limit the number of terms that you can pick. So you may only be able to pick 10 terms. So you have to immediately engage in the 80-20 rule and say which claim terms are likely to impact the outcome of the case. Identify those terms. Then you exchange the construction. Then you have the briefing and the hearing. In an ideal situation that often does not exist, the Markman hearing then would be dispositive because the parties have selected the terms that will decide whether the patent is infringed or not, or whether the patent has a distinction from the prior art. And so here is a typical, this is the Southern District of California, San Diego. You can see the complaint is filed. Four months later, you have the infringement contentions. Six months later, the invalidity contentions. Seven to eight months after the complaint, you exchange the claim construction, and you have the claim construction hearing nine to ten months after the filing of the complaint. Here's the Eastern District of Texas. And two things about the Eastern District of Texas, because, again, they're hoping that parties settle and settle quickly. The Eastern District of Texas, infringement contentions, they also include a good faith damage estimate, trying to identify if this case has enough money to actually be worth fighting about. Exchange of constructions, exchange of evidence, the claim construction. So, one of the issues that faces it when you are now thinking about it, so now I'm putting on my litigator hat, which is the hat I normally wear in my life, is this is what happens with regards to that decision. The patent plaintiffs would prefer that virtually no terms are interpreted and would like to go to trial with their expert. In contrast, the patent defendant typically seeks to have numerous terms interpreted in hopes of generating a non-infringement argument and they tend to try to limit the scope of the claim terms to one of the embodiments of the patent, which is typically, by the time a patent is asserted, obsolete technology. The typical age of a patent asserted in the United States is on the age of 10 to 12 years after issuance. And that probably means 14 or 15 years after it was filed. So if a defendant in 2015 can limit the plaintiff, the 2001 or 2 technology, that may generate additional non-infringement arguments. Now, interestingly enough, now this study is a little older, but this study, they ask whether or not you're more likely to have a claim construction if you have local patent rules, or whether or not you let the judge individually decide. Um, at the dinner last night, I remember there was a discussion of whether or not the judges should all apply the same rule or whether the judges can make an individual decision. Here in claim construction in the U.S., it did have some impact that the percentage of cases that made it to claim construction went higher with the local patent rules than with the judges that did not have local patent rules. The main reason for this is that the judges who didn't have the local patent rules tended to want to decide the claim construction later in the case at the summary judgment stage, increased the likelihood of settlement before ever reaching it, which resulted in a lower percentage of cases making it to claim construction. So by forcing where procedurally in the matter it goes, it probably increases or decreases the likelihood of settle of Markman. And here is the statistics for East Texas and Delaware. 
over the last decade, about 10 to 11 percent of the cases made it to claim construction, typically about 500 days. Uh, two to five percent made it to trial, about 730 to 50 days. The plaintiff win rate in East Texas was two percent versus one, which means the cases were resolved before decisions were made. Cases in Delaware uh, were resolved more often on the issues, and you had a four percent versus three percent win rate. So, one of the things that it happens when you do this, and I'm not going to go in detail because of time, these slides will provide you what type of information has to be provided earlier. It does put pressure on plaintiffs. The interesting thing is that even though in the United States there was pressure to do these infringement contentions, a lot of the patent reform in the United States that's being considered is requiring this information to accompany the complaint. A lot of the reform being considered in the United States right now is actually requiring a claim chart with the complaint. And for those company, companies that have been in the ITC, you know that is what the requirement is for an ITC case. So interestingly, in the U.S., you're getting increased pressure for parties who own patents to come forth earlier with their claims. So I want to talk about briefly the intrinsic evidence and the extrinsic evidence. And answer one of the questions that Roger had earlier. The intrinsic evidence is the public record that everyone can rely on. So in the United States, I always say that a patent is like a no trespassing sign. And the purpose of that sign is to let everyone see it and know it. And so the courts tend to rely on the intrinsic evidence because that's the document that everyone anywhere can see. And so that's the patent, the claims, the prosecution history, and the cited references. So the one comment I would make to Roger, so come over here to talk to him, but is the fact that in a patent, you have the cited references, all the prior art that was found in the search results and the prior art that was cited. That is intrinsic evidence. And so if you wanted to talk about the level of skill in the art in the United States, my strong recommendation is to use the references that were considered by the patent office they're already the evidence of record of what was going on in the field. And so you can have evidence of level of skill that's part of the extrinsic, intrinsic evidence without ever going to extrinsic evidence. And while both his honors would might, probably would not say it as bluntly, courts are highly suspect of any expert or evidence that the lawyers come up with as part of the litigation process. So if you can point to something that existed prior to the litigation process, and in particular point to something that existed as part of the public record, your chances of winning on claim construction are much higher. And so I do believe that as part of the intrinsic record, there is strong evidence of what is the level of skill in the art, and it's something that is underutilized in my experience. So again, public record, no trespassing. The key points of the intrinsic evidence here are including the prior art references cited in the prosecution history. Now, one of the issues that makes very difficult, so when I teach patent litigation at Santa Clara Law School and, and at Stanford, I always ask people about rules, right? Most rules don't really give you the result. And the best example of this is the, the fundamental rule that the Phillips case says. The specification. The specification is always highly relevant to claim construction analysis. Usually it is dispositive. It is the single best guide to the meaning of a disputed term. And all my students go, voila, it's so clear. Well, just a little bit further down the page, although the specification often describes very specific embodiments of the invention, we have repeatedly warned against confining claims to those embodiments. So the fundamental fight in a U.S. patent case is whether when you are trying to use the specification as a guide, which is what you're supposed to do, versus when you're trying to improperly limit the claim from something in the specification. And this is the very important point. There is no perfect construction. In an adversarial process, you just want your construction to be the more reasonable of the two. 
So when you are looking there and the court is trying to decide between two constructions, it's which of the two constructions are most reasonable in light of Phillips, as opposed to the construction that might exist in a vacuum. Most courts, not all, some courts independently come up with the construction on their own, but most courts, because they're busy, choose between the constructions of two opposing parties. And therefore, the key issue in a Markman hearing is to be the one who looks most consistent, most reasonable with Vitronics and Phillips. That's the key point. For example, um, in some cases, in some situations, I'm six feet one, I'm tall. But in one of the cases I had, my partner was 6'5", and both associates were 6'8". I was short. And that's the same thing that applies when in the adversarial process in claim construction. Your goal is to be the more reasonable, rational of two components.